to get over myself and let the king of glory be who he is I refuse to drag anything through this life that has bothered me or hurt me or tormented me I refuse to drag one thing of my past not one thing will I drag because the Bible said that I have been set free the Bible says whom the Lord sets free is what? Free indeed. That means all over. I'm free all over. By the grace of a living God. And y'all have to excuse me if I act like it sometimes. I want to act like I'm saved. And like I'm delivered. And like I'm free. And like I'm whole. This earth I'm living in is temporary. And I know it. I feel like hollering with John the Apostle. Lord Jesus, come now, even so. Come quickly, Lord. John cried for him to come in a hurry. Oh, if you can ever get a relationship with God like that, your whole world will be turned upside down. You'll look at everything through a different different set of lens. Yes, you will. You can be seated this morning. We got a video to show, but we're going to show it a little bit later. To honor our veterans and we are so thankful and proud of all of them that have served and this morning it is my true desire to challenge you to push you to make you think a little bit I will be using some old songs a couple of them just uh, reading a few stanzas from them but I think sometimes we get a little bit complacent in the body of Christ we get complacent with our relationship because we go on trying to live life and when dealing with all the multitude of things that come upon us and, and uh, take our attention away. But church, the, the most absolute sure thing in your life, in fact, the only sure thing in your life is that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and He does not change. The only sure foundation that you have is Him. There is no other sure foundation. Everything else is sinking sand. All that we see, all the houses and cars and bank accounts and everything that we know on this planet is going to burn. The only thing of value that I have is what God gave me. And what he gave me was a living soul when he stepped over the balcony of heaven and breathed into Adam that very first time. From Adam all the way into now, I inherited that living, breathing soul. And the only thing of value, the only thing I'm going to take out of this world, 
I'm not taking anything else out. You know, I met with a financial planner last week, and we yabbered and jabbered about numbers and numbers and numbers, and, and I got to meet with him again. But I fully understand that that doesn't make a hill of beans a difference. I've got one thing that I'm carrying out of this place with me, and it's on the inside of me. It's my relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, and I want to live it. I want to live every day as, as if this was the last. I haven't always done that. I'm not, I don't always do that, but I always want to do that. I always want to live like I'm not going to live much longer. Like tomorrow, today could be that final hour. This morning I want to use as a subject, the anchor holds. Now you think about that. Some of you that's been around the church a long time have sang about the anchor. Some of you folks that hadn't been around very long don't know what an anchor is. But I'll tell you before it's over. An anchor is a device for holding something in place to cause it to be immovable. An anchor sets boundaries. And you have all kinds of anchors that we use on a regular basis that we don't know about. You have ship anchors that, that hold ships in place. You have bolt anchors for holding buildings in place. Roof anchors for holding people in place when they're working on a steep roof. And then you have the anchor of your soul. And his name is Jesus Christ. He is the anchor for the soul and there is no other. There is no other anchor except Jesus Christ. The world needs this anchor. But the world is discarding this anchor. And some in the church... Are discarding this anchor. We used to sing a couple of old songs years ago on the anchor. In one of it went like this: In times like these, we need a savior. In times like these, we need an anchor. And then it went on to say, Be very sure your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. This rock is Jesus. And we need to be sure that our anchor holds and grips that rock. Because I'm afraid the anchor is starting to grip a lot of other rocks. The other one we used to sing out of the old blue book, page 275. Some of you remember that. Some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. But we used to have a blue song book. And one of the songs was, I've anchored in Jesus. And this is what it says. The first line, upon life's boundless ocean where mighty billows roll, I fix my hope in Jesus, the blessed anchor of my soul. When trials fierce assail me, as storms are gathering o'er, I rest upon His mercy and trust Him more. I've anchored in Jesus, the storms of life I'll brave. Je I'll fear no wind nor wave. I've anchored in Jesus. Folks, we need to get our anchor in the rock-solid name of Jesus Christ because there is no other name under heaven whereby man might be saved. Right. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 16 through 20. For men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath of confirmation is for them an end to all dispute. And you need to read that. Some of us absolutely do not know that and have not read that and do not understand what's going on. Thus God determined to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of His counsel. The first verse says that men need an oath, a contract. And God knows that about us. Thus, God determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise. Are you an heir of the promise of Jesus Christ this morning? The immutability of His counsel confirmed it by an oath. Because He knew we needed one. So God said, I will confirm it by an oath. That by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. We might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope 
that is set before us. God determined to swear an oath that he would hold us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul. That anchor is Jesus Christ. Both sure and steadfast. And which enters the presence behind the veil. Talking about Jesus Christ being our anchor. Where the forerunner has entered for us. Even Jesus having become high priest forever. According to the order of Melchizedek. God does not need an oath. His word is enough. He cannot lie. But in his kindness and understanding. God accommodated himself to human weakness. By confirming his word with an unbreakable oath. Do you even understand the power of that statement? We sing this little child song. Every chapter, every verse, every line. Every promise in the Bible is mine. I'm convinced that the one who wrote that has read that verse of Scripture. Because that, that verse of Scripture is an assurance to us. That every chapter, every verse, and every line in the Bible is ours. We must find it. We must search it out. We must know the truth of Jesus Christ. He accommodated himself to our human weakness. Think about that. And he made an oath that he cannot lie. Look at Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie. Nor a son a man that he should repent. Has he said and will he not do? Oh, look at that verse of scripture. Has God said something that he won't do? Has God promised to be with you in every way? Has God promised to take care of you? Has God promised to be your Savior? Has God promised to be your light, your peace, your hope, your everything, your all in all? Has God promised all of those things? That verse of Scripture calls to mind that he, has He said He would do something and not? Or has He spoken and will He not make it good? When I read the Bible, I know that it's good. Not all contracts you read are good. They got that fine print that we never read because we can't. Ordinary, ordinary hope is a state of mind where we face uncertainty with very shading, with very sh varying shades of expectation, depending on the prospect, how the prospect looks. For example, we may hope that it rains tomorrow. Don't worry, it's going to. But Christian hope is a fact. A firm expectation that we can lay hold. And like an anchor it will hold us sure and secure in all the storms that life may bring. You need to know if you're in a storm that the anchor Jesus Christ will not fail you. Am, am I even preaching to anybody in here? Lord have mercy. I thought sure I was in a Pentecostal church. I'm going to leave. I'm, I'm in the wrong house. I'm going to get a mirror to set up here. And I'm not kidding and I'm not scolding, but you ought to see yourself. I'm preaching the truth of the Word of God. And folks, this is what's happening to the body of Christ. And wait till I get on down through this thing. I've got a few more roads to plow yet. You better start acting like, and you know, you better quit laying it on your personality. Your personality may get you in a little trouble. Society and Christendom is trying to remove Jesus as the anchor of the soul. They are trying to replace it with, a, with pluralism. How many of you know what pluralism is? You need to study. Pluralism is defined as the idea that all religions are equally valid. And means those who believe that there are many ways to live and think. And also thinks that government and society should be structured in such a way to encourage and appreciate and accept all the differences. Bottom line, Jesus is not exclusively the only one that can bring salvation. You know it, can you articulate it? Can you say it? Can you believe it and can you defend it? 
This is not among secular society. This is also in the church. Not this church, but it's in the church. It, and if we're not careful, it's going to get in some of you. It's going to get in some of you because the devil is out advertising us and out preaching us. You can't turn the television on in the news without hearing that pluralism is the way of going. He's out marketing us, folks. Bottom line, the devil is out marketing us. He is out there every day on the front line propagating his, his gospel. And we need to be on the front line as Christians telling the story that there is no other name under heaven whereby man can be saved except the name Jesus Christ. It sounds good. It sounds wonderful to say everybody's going to go to heaven. Folks, they're not. Christians have just about lost the battle over biblical truth. And if we continue down the road that we're on of do nothing and say nothing, we're in danger of surrendering the most important issues of our faith. Let me show you what's happening in our nation right now and has been slowly moving toward or forward into the thinking of the minds of Christians. Satan has a strategy. If you don't think he has a very strategic plan against us, you're wrong. And that strategy is to remove the foundation of our faith. If he can move the fence, you'll have nowhere to belong. And folks, he's moving the fence on some of you. Look, he's not making you believe false religion right now. But what he is doing is making you just be a flatline. A lot of people are becoming flatline Christians. We don't know boo from up. We couldn't, we couldn't, we don't practice the Bible. We don't know the Bible. We can't recite the Bible. We don't live the Bible. We go to church. And there's a difference between going to church and being a Christian. The devil goes to church every Sunday morning, but he's not a Christian. He's there every Sunday sitting beside you with all the multiplicity of things and thoughts that's going on through your mind. And we got all, he's got so many distractions going for us. Some of us are texting. Some of us are thinking. Some of us are talking. Some of us are making plans after church already, and we need him out. None, and do you know that we don't, we're not guaranteed we're going to get out? We may go to heaven right now. Come on, somebody help me preach today. He has been trying to destroy Jesus since he was birthed. He has killed babies in an effort to kill Jesus. He has told lies about Jesus. He has caused the church to turn against Jesus. Even, mas even his ministers masquerade as ministers of life. Let me tell you. And eventually he got Jesus Christ to the cross. But that was the greatest mistake he ever made. Because when he got him to the cross, he got him to the grave. And when he got him to the grave, he got him to the resurrection. And when he got him to the resurrection, he got me hope. He got me eternal hope that one day I will rise from the dead and be in heaven where he is. Let me tell you, when he got him on the cross, that was the biggest mistake the devil ever made. Was getting Jesus on that old rugged cross. Because when he got there, he got me hope. He got me deliverance. He got me freedom. And he got me healing. And we need to know that. The devil is in every pulpit around America, or, or in a lot of pulpits around America every day. Let me show you how I know. 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into a, apostles of Christ. Look at that next verse. And no wonder, and no wonder, for Satan himself transformed himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers, excuse me, transform themselves into ministers of righteousness whose end will be according to their works. You think he doesn't go to church? You think he hadn't been wiggling his way in churches all of this time and moving up to become pastors and Sunday school teachers and youth directors? Well, let me tell you, he has. And he is doing that. And you better be careful, some of you that go to every house on the county, you better be careful where you're going. I would not go to a church unless I walk by and pull that piece of paper and say, what do they believe? If they don't believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ and that he is the only way and a few other things, I put it down and exit because that ain't the place for FG to be. Ain't no place for me to be. 
Paul warned that just as Satan masquerades as an angel of light, pretending to be one of God's angels, he also empowers false apostles or preachers to masquerade as preachers of the gospel. We don't know that. Here, let me tell you, they may sincerely... Be, they may sincerely be caring and loving, and they may preach forgiveness and peace and brotherhood and many other helpful things, but they are under the influence of the adversary. You see, you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit to tell you when to run and when to get out of Dodge. It was the Holy Spirit that told Paul, Don't there go here not now later it was the holy spirit that directed him not to go over here because there was danger there and we don't know that some of us don't pay any attention to that have you ever been driving down the road and had a, a just this feeling i shouldn't go this way some of you just keep on going that way you know, when that spirit checks you in here, when you ought not to participate in this, you ought not to be a part of that, you go on and do it anyway. Well, that ain't too bad. They're doing good work. They're feeding the hungry. They're doing this. The devil is a deceitful strategist. strategist. He will do everything he can to get your mind off of the fact that there is no other name under heaven whereby man can be saved except Jesus Christ and him crucified, resurrected, and returning. Here's where, here's where the church is right now. Let's look at how the view or at the view from the pew in many houses today. How it's changed over the last 30 or 40 years. Boy, the pew from out there has really changed. Now, when I was going to church, if somebody came in and stood in this pulpit and preached something that wasn't true, my old pastor would get up and saddle on up there and put his hand on and say, Son, you might ought to go restudy that again. And that might be a Church of God of Prophecy boy. You need to go restudy that again. Go ahead on and sit down. Let me help you out. And then set the congregation straight. We wouldn't do that today if our life depended on it. Let's just consider a few things that's going on. Consider gay marriage. The Bible teaches against it. Is that true? Yes. And the church supports the Bible or did support the Bible. In 1996, the percentage of Americans who favor same-sex marriage has more than doubled. Because the devil is outselling that agenda. He's out marketing us. We're afraid to stand up. You know what? We'll just be quiet and go to heaven. <clears throat> We're going to have to answer for all the souls that God brought in our way and we didn't touch. Somebody help me. Responding to that trend, the Supreme Court passed a law on June 26, 2015, that gay marriage was a law of the land. However, the same Supreme Court. A Supreme Court in 1885 said in Murphy versus Ramsey that marriage is a sacred union between a man and a woman from which all good things in society come. 130 years later, that definition has changed. Now, fast forward 25 years and your children are having children, are running the church. You better hear me. As parents, we need to be doing a job. We need to quit fussing and carrying on about stupid stuff and get down to the business of being bone yard saved to the bone Christian men and women, doing what is right, what is just, not because we got some strange idea of, of what we think is right. How many times have I challenged you with the fact that truth is not what I say it is and truth is not what you say it is. Truth is what the Bible says it is. I'm going to be judged according to the truth, not anything else. And I'm telling you right now, we can't just go to church and do nothing. Go to church and believe nothing. Go to church and not worship the King of glory. We will give an account for that. What has changed? Has the Bible changed or has God changed? No. Culture has changed. The Supreme Court caved in to political pressure. 
not just the Supreme Court or the liberal activists have changed society. Gullible citizens and Christians. My people are destroyed for... Finish the, finish the scripture. Say it again. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Lack of, knowledge. Lack of wisdom. Lack of understanding. You can, you can elaborate on that word. We need wisdom. We need understanding. We need discernment. We need Holy Spirit. And we need to get us off the throne and put him on the throne of our lives. <clears throat> I, I know I'm being a little tough today, and I don't mean to be, but listen. The clock is ticking. Jesus is coming. And we're getting ready to go. But until we do go, we've got, we've got to occupy. Is that what the Bible says? Occupy until I come. Build homes. Plant vineyards. And do until I get there. In other words, go about business of living and winning and teaching and helping and giving hope to people. <clears throat> Christians and citizens are buckling under cultural pressure to condone what the Bible condemns. Christians are increasingly supportive of homosexual un unions, especially the millennial generation here's why this is dangerous the millennial generation is the most unchurched largest church in history of the world well what does that matter to me pastor they're going to be driving the boat pretty soon they're in that age group of 18 to 30. They're going to hold political office. They're going to be judges. They're going to be pastors. They're going to be teachers. They're going to be parachurch leaders. They're going to be all of those things in a, in a little while. But we sit here as ducks in a pond waiting to be picked off. Well, I know, all I know, pastors, I'm going to heaven. You got to take a few with you. Let me ask you this. This week, have you witnessed anybody? Have you told a soul about Jesus Christ this week? If we haven't, somehow we're being disobedient, I think. Go ye therefore into all the world. <clears throat> I like the last part of that. If you go, I'll go with you. If you don't go, you're on your own, boss. That's what he, you, you may not get that, but that's, that's 21st language, 21st century language. You go, I go. You don't go, you're on your own. Because he ain't riding with nobody that ain't doing. I'm too shy. I'm too timid. Find ways. Pass out tracks. You know, you don't have to get a megaphone. You don't have to be a preacher. And you don't have to stand on the corner. But what you have to do is share the gospel some kind of way. Now, if I brought 500 business cards and, and offered to give them to all of you guys in here that want them, that just said, New Horizons Church, you were invited in the church's address and phone and time and all that, would you pass those out? I know you would. <laughs> I, I can count on Angie and Connie. They're going to do it. They're going to get it done. They're going to pass them out. They, if, if everybody in the church drove me as crazy as they do about, let's, let's do something, let's do something, I'd be an excited preacher. And these two are always telling me, come on, let's do something. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go win somebody. I want to feed somebody poor. I want to give them a blanket. I wanna... And they make me go out and find blankets for them. I, I've got two bundles of blankets for you. A recent Pew Re Religion Forum. Now, this is just religion. Reveal that 58% of young evangelical Christians support some kind of legal recognition of homosexual marriage. 58% of millennials that go to church support gay marriage. What does that matter? They're in the age group of 18 to 30. We'll be taking my place and some of your places. Some of you young folks in here that are saved to the bone need to think about that. How, are you going to relinquish the reins of the body of Christ to that? generation over half over half of the christians in america over half 58 percent of these young fellows and young ladies how can this change in opinion among the general population and especially among christians be explained how can it be explained 
How do we explain this, this phenomenon? What has happened? God has not changed. We have the same Bible. How is what I believe so different from what they believe? What happened? We go to church. We sing to the same God. We clap our hands. We dance. We pass out tracts. We feed the poor. We help the homeless. We do all of those things. But what has happened? We do all of those external things. But internally, we are believing a different gospel. How is that possible? Glad you asked. The devil is out preaching us. That's the bottom line. He's just out marketing us. He's out preaching us. Christians are waffling and wavering and in the process of giving up on the bedrock of our belief. And that is that salvation is only through Christ alone. We're giving up that bedrock. And I know we don't believe that. You may think that's an exaggeration of the facts, but I got the data. Here are the facts. A recent Pew study revealed that 70% of Americans with a religious affiliation say that many religions, not just theirs, can lead to eternal life. Pastors are saying that. A famous pastor got on TV with Larry King and said that. He said, for me now, I believe that Jesus is the way, but I don't believe there are not other ways. But for me. Now, what kind of preacher worth his salt would make a stupid statement like that when you read the Bible? There is no other name under heaven whereby man, no other name even given under heaven. How could we make it? We don't want to be challenged politically. We want to be politically correct, but we're challenged by God to be biblically correct. I've been carrying this inside of me. My, my class on Wednesday night's been getting a little bit of this. It's been kind of creeping out a little bit among me, but I'm trying to hold it down. Here's another thing. A 2008 poll of 35,000 Americans revealed that 57% of evangelical church attenders believe that many religions can lead to eternal life. 70% of all religious affiliations, that's Buddhists and Muslims and all of that stuff, but 57% of evangelical Christians believe that. These are guys that go to church every Sunday. These are guys that tithe and give and work in Sunday school and work with your children and do all of that and, and are out there feeding the poor and it looks wonderful. But they have come to believe, 57% of evangelical Christians have come to believe that there's another name under heaven whereby you can be saved. That leads to eternal life. Now, where are they getting this idea? Let's, let, me, let me bring this verse back up. And you ought to wrote this down. 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen through 15. Let me just read this again. <clears throat> Tony, would you back it up one verse maybe? No, don't do it. I got to hurry. Don't, don't back it up. I, I got to hurry. I got some more I want to preach and I don't have the time. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. There they are. That's who they are, and that's who we're dealing with. You strike up a conversation. Hey, I had a conversation with a guy that attends a church. I'm not going to tell you where, but right there, he stood on that, in that doorway right there and told me, I, you ought not, I have a bone to pick with you. You call Jesus, Jesus. I said, well, what would you like me to call him? That's exactly what I said. You in my house challenging me about what I call the Savior of the world? I didn't call him that. God called him that. The translation is Jesus. Yeshua, whatever you want to call him. He had some other name he wanted me to call him. And I, and I just looked at him. I said, in your house, you call him what you want to. In this house, we're calling him Jesus Christ. Our conversation was over. He left. Came over and brought me a coffee cup and really, really kind of greased me up a little bit and talked to me and then, and then began to tell me that I was all wrong. That didn't fly well with me. What you believe about the exclusivity of the gospel of Jesus Christ will determine one day whether you spend eternity in heaven or whether you spend it in hell, folks. It's going to determine that one of these days. The Bible in Acts chapter one, 4, 1 through 12, and I've got to read all of this to you, and I want you to write this down and go home and read it yourself. 
Now as they spoke to the people, the priest, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them. Now this is where Peter and them had performed a healing. And this is the after story. You've got to read Acts chapter 3, latter part, to get the story of what's happening here. So this is what picks up after they've already healed this beggar fella. Being greatly disturbed. Now this is the church that was greatly disturbed. The, the um, Sadducees and the priests were very disturbed that these apostles, that Peter and them, was walking around healing people. They were disturbed over this. Being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus. This is not a new thing. The devil's been carrying that water for a long time. But the, the early Christians just wouldn't let them carry the water. But I'm afraid that today, if we're not careful, we're going to let them carry the water. That they don't want us to preach in the name of Jesus. How many of you know they're taking them out of everywhere? Or trying to. Being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening time. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. Just flip on through them, Tony. And it came to pass on the next day that their rulers, elders, and scribes, as well as an, 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 Ananias, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and as many were with the family of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel. I'm going to slow down. I can read better. If we this day are judged for a good deed done to the helpless man by what means he has been made well let it be known to you and all of the people of israel that by the name of jesus christ of nazareth whom you crucified whom god raised from the dead by him this man stands here before you whole this is the stone which was rejected by the builders which became the chief cornerstone nor is there salvation in any other for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now, either some Bibles have removed this, or we are changing our belief on that scripture. Because the Bible plainly says there's no other name under heaven whereby we can be saved. But they're preaching there's other names under heaven whereby we can be saved. In this verse, the Sanhedrin thought Peter and John, or excuse me, thought Peter and John and the beggar were on trial. But in reality, Jesus Christ was on trial again because that the source of his power behind the paralyzed man's healing, Jesus Christ is always on trial. Listen, when they are talking against you and railing against you, it's Jesus that's on trial. That's who they're angry at. They want to eradicate them. Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Let me finish up. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. There are many who will go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to eternal, leads to life, and there are few who find it. John 14, 5 and 6. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going and how we can know the way. Jesus said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You need to know that, church. That is the tenements of the faith. You need to know that. We, listen to me. We were created as spiritual beings, every last one of us in here. And we feel a need for reconciliation with our Creator. We do feel that need. We have a need on the inside of us to be reconciled with our Creator. Satan, understanding that need, realizes that the most effective way to prevent people from legitimately connecting with God through faith in Christ is to offer a thousand other directions.
Millions of Christians are surrendering their core beliefs in Christ alone. Peter challenged every follower to always be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks him to give an account. Let's look at 1 Peter 3.15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Somebody help me today. And always be ready to give an offense to in everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. I am always to be ready to articulate why I believe in Jesus Christ. Because some of us, if we're not careful, they can challenge our faith. Can your faith be challenged? My faith cannot be challenged in Jesus Christ. Well, I don't know. I believe and this new phase comes over here and we're off chasing this thing. And then this new thing's over here and we're off chasing it. And then we're off. We're just like that. We're just fluffing around out there in la-la land. We need to quit that. What can we do? I'm so glad you asked me that. I love it when you guys ask me questions. The church must stand up and be counted. <clears throat> we need to return to our prayer closets. Why is it to me? We can have a potluck and the whole church shows up. We can have a prayer meeting and three show up. If I did that, I couldn't look myself in the mirror and comb my hair and shave my face and get ready to go to work. I could not do that. I'm just being very honest with you. I, there's no way on earth I could do that. If I didn't go talk to God once in a while, on a regular basis, like every day, like three or four times a day, if I didn't read His Word every day of my life, if I didn't let His Word read me every day of my... I don't think I can make it, Sue. I mean, I, feel, I would feel like a, a boneyard hypocrite. I'm amazed at the number... Of, you know, I, I shouldn't tell on myself. I'm amazed at the number of Bibles I can find laying around in this church with your name on it that stays in here for a week and a half. I hope you got several Bibles at home. I tell you, if I leave my Bible at church, I come back. Even though I got 19 Bibles like this and about 37 Bibles on my computer, I come back to get my Bible. You know why? Because that's my Bible. I held that Bible up on a Sunday morning and says, this is my Bible. Buddy, I am not leaving my sword anywhere. We need to return to that prayer closet and start to get a hold of God and let God get a hold of us. I tell you, if you'll start praying, you'll start reading the Word of God because He'll begin to move on you. You'll begin to feel things and, and, and that you just don't understand and you'll go get the Word. We need to, turn to the, return to the prayer closet, the street corner, the workplace, the grocery market, and every other place where we go and be a Christian and tell the story of Jesus Christ. That means as followers of Christ, it may be uncomfortable sometimes. The problem is a lot of Christians don't know what they believe. Or they may not be able to articulate what they believe. You need to be able to articulate what you believe. Chris, you want to go ahead? This need must change. It must change, folks. It must start with you. You're Christians. We need to know why we believe what we believe and be able to say it, to articulate it. We need to make sure our anchor holds and grips the solid rock, Christ alone. How do we do this? We read the Bible. We be faithful to our church. We get involved in everything that is going on. We read the Word. We study the Word. We live the Word and we share the Word. When it's time to worship, what time is it? It's time to worship. Not to stand there like this. If, I, if I'm scolding a little bit now, yeah, I am. Because that's how we stand there. We stand there like this. I mean, people singing and dancing around. You stand right there. Not asking you to dance or spin or shout or do any of those things. But I'm simply asking you to worship. To worship the living God. To worship the King of glory. You can get so comfortable with a mode that it becomes who you are. And it will forever be you. What you see about me is that that's forever me. It hasn't always been that. But I was so grateful that God saved me and forgave my sins. I was so grateful to th for that. And I'm still so grateful for that. I, I couldn't help myself. 
When I first got saved, our, our, our house was three miles from the church, maybe that far. I mean, sometimes I just have to walk down there once or twice before church ever started. I get up so early, I'd be so excited to go to church, I'd go off and leave my family. <laughs> and then when I got the car and I was a driver, everybody had to be ready to go early. If you've ever been around me when it's time to go to church, you know I'm going. I don't care what anybody else is doing, I'm going to church. I don't care if we got company. They can go or they can stay, but I'm going. Those are, I'm not asking you to do that. That's, those are convictions that Frank has, and they're not changing. I'm not going to go in a movie or any other place and them show something obtuse or, or wrong on that, on that screen and stay in there and, and close my eyes and endure it. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to get up and go get my money back. I'm not going to be offensive to my Lord. Because when I call his name, I expect him to answer me. When the doctor told me I was sick, I expected a healing. I expected nothing else but a healing and a deliverance. Before salvation, I couldn't make a book report. You couldn't make me get up here if you want to. I took elves in school. When it came oral book report time, I took an elf. I could write a paper. I could write a paper as good as anybody, but I couldn't give an oral report if my life depended on it. I just said, go ahead and give me my elf. I'm done. When I got saved, I sat in a chair at the back door as far back as I could sit. And then I started moving up till I got to the front row and I'm not left. I'm not asking you all to sit on the front row. Y'all won't fit. But I'm asking that your, your heart, let it be front row. I'm challenging you for the hope and the prosperity of the body of Christ. That we don't give up. That we don't just say, Sarah, Sarah. That we hold true to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Would you stand with me today? <clears throat> I'm sorry I kept you a little long. This has been troubling me for a while. I've had a lot of conversations with a lot of our pastors about this, this very thought. I've had conversations with God about this thought. What's going on, God? So I began to research and read and study and look and find this data. The more I looked, the more alarmed I got and realized that it's up to the church to turn the tide. But it's hard for the church to turn the tide when 57% of them believe that there's other, other name under heaven whereby you can be saved. And 58% of them believe that gay marriage is okay and 70% of society in general believe those things. That's tough. That's tough. What's that going to look like? What that's going to look like is this. When I'm up here preaching that kind of gospel, the gospel that I just preached to you, is going to make some out there vacate and leave. Because I, I don't believe that. I've had that happen. And people tell me, I don't believe that. I said, well, there it is. I know, but this is a 21st century and we live in an enlightened age and surely we don't expect to believe something like the Bible that's that archaic here's what I hear I refuse to serve a God that's that cruel I hear those things because I ask a lot of questions <laughs> lots of questions if I meet you and, and talk with you, I'll ask you everything about you. I'll ask you about your family, where he's raised, how you like him. Whatever. I'll ask you a, a lot of questions. I'm building, a, I'm building who you are. That's how I formulate who you are is knowing what you like and what you don't like and where you're from. That's how I know who you are. I got to know more than just, hey, this is Ryan. I, eventually, I got to know more about this guy than that. I want to know his wife, and how they got married. His kids and how old they are. 
where he works. I know where he works at. And I know those things because I want, I want to know that about him. I don't want to be a, oh, what's that guy's name? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to be that way. Can we pray? If you, if you need salvation this morning, I invite you to come to this altar to pray. If you just need to come talk to God about all I preached about today, I'll invite you to come to this altar and pray with me. If you just want to come up here and say, Lord, I need to pray about this, or if you want to kneel at your seat or raise your hands at your seat, however you want to do, and pray about this, I know I want to pray about this. I want to pray about it. Father in heaven, I ask you right now <clears throat> that you would look from your lofty place in heaven and hear us from heaven. That you would smile on this congregation this morning and that we would begin to live what we say. Lord, we would live it at, at work. We would not be rude or arrogant, but we would be humble and we would just stand our ground on what we believe. God, I'm not asking us to take a megaphone and stand on the street unless you so direct us. But God, we can pass out a gospel track. We can pass out a business card that invites people to church. God, we'll be careful to honor you for that and to give you praise in Jesus' name. Before you're seated, I want, to, I want you to pray with, for a man by the name of Kevin. He's 66 years old. I met him Friday when I was buying the grease trap for our, for our church. He was standing in line in front of me at a, at a plumbing store. I got his name, his phone number, and he told me that he's struggling with prostate cancer and that a lot of things are going negative in his life. And um, we had an opportunity to share standing there. We talked to him. We got excited about God. Yeah, he's a Christian man. We got excited about God. We got so excited about God that the guy that was selling us the stuff got excited about God and started asking, hey, what church you go to? I think I might want to come out there. And so I, I shared with him where we were. And when we left, he, we went out in the parking lot. Hey, and we looked totally different. Did I mention he was black? But does it make any difference? doesn't we went out in the parking lot and we stood there and we prayed and we cried a bit together he said I know God brought you my way today God is trying to take you to somebody every day and let you share the gospel don't be afraid to just to be authentically who you are just be that person that loves God with all of your heart and just wants other people to know what you know joy of salvation can we pray for my friend father I bring Kevin to you today and his family Lord I bring them to you and I ask you almighty God that you would touch Kevin today and touch his sickness Lord he is dealing with all of these emotions and Lord the doctors have got him messed up pretty good and I pray for him and I ask you God to touch him by your healing hand put your hand of grace on him and mercy <clears throat> touch him and protect him oh God and, Lord, I will be careful to praise you and to give honor to you. Lord, I love you and I thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. I want us to pray for one more thing before we, before we change. A few days ago, a week or two ago, my wife got a message on Messenger uh, from a young lady in Arkansas that I do not know. She knows my brother and she knows my dad. My brother was at my dad's house, and I have given my dad some CDs and uh, me preaching, and so he plays them every day, and he was playing them, and my, my, my brother took them, my adopted brother, he took them, and uh, he took them back and shared them with a co-worker, and, co and then he shared them with his girlfriend, I think, she's a girlfriend, and um, then she messaged, give us a message on Messenger, telling us that these, these CDs are being a blessing in their life. So we never know. You know, when they see those CDs, they see all of you. Or, or if it's a DVD, they see all of you. When they go online, they see all of you. And so I want to pray that the gospel will go out and that this, this New Horizons can be a beacon and can be a light and we will share the gospel. 
unashamedly that we will tell the story as long and as loud as we have a voice and have the technology and the finances to do what we do in this department. Let's pray for that. Father, I pray for this young lady, Lord, in Arkansas. I pray for her. She's gotten the CDs, and I pray, God, that you would help her as they listen to these, Lord, over and over again. Help me to get some new ones to her. But, God, I pray that um, you would just be a blessing in her life and in my brother's life and in the co-worker's life and in my dad's life and and all of those that these are touching as they let them, other people listen in, Lord. I pray that you would... Just start a revival among them back there. God, let this gospel that we preach touch their lives and change their lives, God. In Jesus' name we pray today.